Alright, if we can have everybody in your place and quiet. The, the fellowship and fellowship time is just wonderful. But since we were all foreordained and predestined to be get together today refuting Calvinism, let's not get distracted from that. So let's make the best of it. The next, if we can have everybody focused, it really helps. I know that takes real discipline when you've got this many people and listening to you fellowship is marvelous. But. The next section in our notes uh, was written by my friend, Pastor George Zeller. It's a doctrine of limited atonement. This is what the Calvinists believe. This is what he has to say about it. This is commonly <clears throat> known as a belief in a limited atonement. Some reform men prefer to call it a definite atonement, and I would say some call it a particular atonement. It is the teaching that Christ died on the cross and paid the penalty only for the sins of the elect. He did not die for the ones who eventually will be in the lake of fire. Often it is worded as follows. Christ died for all men without distinction, but he did not die for all men without exception. I'll let you make sense out of the brilliance of that. This is a subtle game of semantics, which makes it possible for them to say that he died for all without really meaning that he died for all. Right. What they really mean is that Christ died for all kinds of people and all classes of people. And again, we're going to go through a whole sermon on that. But he did not die for every single person. That is, he died for Jews and Gentiles, rich or poor, slave and free, male and female. But he actually died only for the elect Jews and Gentiles, only elect rich and poor, etc. However, according to scripture, he died. Number one, for all. We read that in 1 Timothy 2.6. We read it in Acts 17. We read it in 2 Peter 3. It's in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6. And what a glorious passage. He died for every man. He died for the world. John 3.16. He died for the sins of the whole world. <coughs> 1 John 2.2. 2. He died for the ungodly. He died for false teachers. He died for many. He died for Israel. He died for the church. He died for me. And for those of you on this side, but not those of you on this side, you understand that's how that works, because all doesn't mean you, and the whole world doesn't mean you, and every doesn't mean you, but fortunately it means you. It's evident that the extreme Calvinist must ignore the clear language and obvious sense of many passages, and he must force the scriptures and make them fit into his own theological mold. He makes them fit into his own theological mold. Makes them fit into his own theological mold. In other words, here's my theology, here's the Bible, I'll twist it and turn it till it fits my theology. Exact opposite of how we ought to get theology. Our theology should always be based on the plain, plain clear statements of Scripture. Limited atonement may seem logical and reasonable, but the real test is this. Is it biblical? What saith the Scriptures? In childlike faith, we must simply allow the Bible to say what it says. Say, so, but wait a minute, the intelligent people don't think it says that. The educated people don't think it says that. The sophisticated people don't think it says that. That doesn't matter. What does it actually say? Okay. Those who promote this erroneous doctrine tell us the word, that world, does not really mean world, and all does not really mean all, and every man does not really mean every man, and the whole world does not really mean the whole world. Aren't you glad you have them to tell you what it means? Because if you were on your own, you know what you'd think all meant? And every man meant? If you were just reading the Bible yourself? 
We are told that simple verses such as John 3.16 and Isaiah 53.6 must be understood not as a child would understand them, but as a theologian would understand them. That is, we must reinterpret such verses in the light of our system of theology. And what I have said repeatedly is I trust bus kids with the Bible more than I do seminary professors. The true doctrine of scripture could be stated as follows. The scriptures teach the sacrifice of the Lord of the Lamb of God involved the sin of the world. And the Savior's work of redemption, reconciliation, propitiation was for all men. But the cross work of Christ is efficient, effectual, and applicable only for those who believe. We should even say it in a simpler way. Christ's death was sufficient for all, but, only, but efficient only for those who believe. Cross work of Christ is not limited, but the application of that cross work through the work of the Holy Spirit is limited to believers only. The extreme Calvinist would say the cross was designed only for the elect and had no purpose for the non-elect. It had no purpose for the non-elect. But the death of God's Son had a divine purpose and design for both groups. For the elect, God's design was salvation according to his purpose and grace in Christ Jesus before the world began. From believers, God's purpose and design is to render the unbeliever without excuse. You know why the unbeliever is without excuse? Because Christ died for him Amen. and offered him the gospel. Men are condemned because they have rejected the personal work of Jesus Christ and refused God's only remedy for sin. Unbelievers can never say that a provision for their salvation was not made and not offered. They can never stand before God and say, the reason I'm not saved is because Christ did not die for me. No, the reason they're not saved is because they rejected the one who died for them, who's the Savior of all men. They are without excuse. The issue is not merely academic. It's extremely practical. It affects the very heart of the gospel in its presentation. The gospel which Paul preached to the unsaved people of Corinth was Christ died for our sins. Do we really have a gospel of good news for all men? That's the blank and that's what you need to ask yourself. Do we really have a gospel of good news for all men? Preaching the gospel, what can we say to an unsaved person? Can we say, my friend, the Lord Jesus Christ died for you. He paid the penalty for your sins. He died as your substitute. One reformed writer said this, but counselors as Christians are obligated to present the claims of Christ. They must present the good news that Christ Jesus died on the cross in the place of his own, that he bore the guilt and suffered the penalty for their sins. He died that all whom the Father had given to him might come to him and have life everlasting. As a reformed Christian, the writer believes that counselors must not tell any unsaved counselee that Christ died for him, for they cannot say that. No man knows but Christ himself, who are his elect, and for whom he died. So nobody but Christ knows. You're absolutely right. So why should I let Jay Adams tell me? Let me go with what Christ said. C.H. McIntosh said, A disciple of the high school of doctrine, extreme Calvinism, will not hear of a worldwide gospel, of God's love to the world, of glad tidings to every creature under heaven, he has only gotten a gospel for the elect. From Lindsay Alexander. How can we sincerely offer to men what has not been provided for them? How can we offer them a free gift if the gift has not been purchased for them? How can we urge them to drink from the fountain of life if no water has been provided for them? How can we tell them to be saved if the Lord Jesus Christ provided not for their salvation? How can we say to a person, take the medicine and be cured if there is no medicine to take and no cure provided? 
W. Lindsay Alexander explains, on this supposition, that of a limited government, limited atonement, the general invitations and promises of the gospel are without an adequate basis and seem like a mere mockery. Like a mere mockery, an offer in short of what has not been provided. It is a mockery. Well, by the good news is Christ died for men, but nobody on this side. God commands you to trust him, but none of you can. And God loves the whole world. He loves the whole world so much he's chosen to save you, but not you. But, but don't worry, he's chosen to save me. That's the important part. Okay. If the Reformed preacher was really honest about it, he would need to preach his gospel along these lines. Perhaps Christ died for you. Maybe God so loved you. God shed his blood for you, perhaps. Salvation has been provided for you, maybe. Possibly God commendeth his love toward you. Hopefully, he's the propitiation for your sins. There's a possibility that Christ died as your substitute. I bring you good news, maybe. It's possible Christ died for you. If you get saved, then we know that he did die for you. But if you continue to reject him, then he did not die for you. Christ died for you only if you believe that Christ died for you, thus proving you elect. But if you do not believe this, and if you continue in your unbelief until the day you die, then Christ did not die for you. By the way, most of the Calvinists don't preach like this. It would be more consistent if they did. But you know why they don't preach like this? Because who would come to hear them? And, and often... the. Even when they preach a Calvinist sermon, they'll sing an invitation song that makes it sound like anyone could come. Can you matter what it would like if they changed all the invitation songs? There's a reason why the, the booming Calvinist movement of the moment, and again, the old style Calvinists, are honest about what they believe. I simply disagree with them. And frankly, they're not the ones that cause you much problem. They go their way, I go my way, and we don't cross each other's paths very much. The new Calvinism is sneaky and deceptive, and it wants to take over churches that were built on the preaching of the gospel. He wants to take over churches that have doctrinal statements that say Christ died for all men want to take over churches that say that the gospel is for the whole world. They want to take over Bible colleges that train folks that Christ died for all men and that it's our job to take the gospel to everybody. But they can't come out, right, come right out and say that. So they tend to be very sneaky and very deceptive even as, and we'll get to this in a later chapter, even as they consciously train people in how to take over churches that were not built by Calvinists. To which I would say, you guys want to have a church? Go build one. You, you want to have a Bible college? Go build one. A God gave us free choice. Even if you don't understand it, he gave you a free choice. You can do that if you want to. Why do they need to take over churches built by non-Calvinists? to take over Bible colleges built by non-Calvinists, to take over and transform mission boards built by non-Calvinists. There's an answer to that. Because they can't build them. Oh. Eh? They have to take over that which was built by the people that believe what they don't believe. Because as we said, isn't it strange that God only seems to predestine people to be saved in non-Calvinist churches? Wouldn't you think he'd predestine them to be saved in the Calvinist churches? If that was true. At least some of them. Okay. 
Uh, next paragraph is from a book by Robert Leitner, and his book is a tribute to John Walford. Those who hold to a definite or limited atonement do not present the gospel in this way, but would not such a presentation be consistent with their theology? Would it not be a correct and cautious and sincere way for sharing with the unsaved? An extreme Calvinist must be very careful how he presents the cross work of Christ to an unsaved person because he never really can be sure if, if Christ made provision for that person. Again, I heard that statement from my family over and over again. How do you know the person you gave the gospel tract to can be saved? As Robert Leitner said, belief in limited atonement means that the good news of God's saving grace in Christ cannot be personalized. Those who hold to such a position cannot tell someone to whom they are witnessing that Christ died for him because that one may, in fact, not be one for whom Christ died. Again, what a horrible thing it would be to go home tonight, lay your head on your pillow and wonder, am I one of the ones that Christ died for or not? From Robert Leitner's book, The Death Christ Dies. John Bunyan made this observation. The offer of the gospel cannot, with God's allowance, be offered any further than the death of Christ did go. Because it would be taken away, there's indeed no gospel, no grace to be extended. In other words, how can you offer the gospel to a person if Christ did not die for that person? How can we offer the sinner what has not been provided? As Leitner said, no maxim appears more certain that sal a salvation offer implies a salvation provided. A salvation offer implies a salvation provided. Aren't you glad you can literally talk to anyone and tell them that Christ died for them? For them. I had a first church I pastored. Had a young lady attending the church. She would come late on purpose. And she, would, she wouldn't come to about time for the preaching to start. And she would leave when the invitation started. She's early 20s. Pretty young blonde lady. And I asked folks about it. Because she really looked like she was listening when I was preaching. What's the deal? And they said, Pastor, you need to leave that alone. They said she was the phrase in the United States, trophy wife of a, a professional criminal in his 60s. A very dangerous man. And he'd married this young woman. And he was so jealous, she was forbidden to ever speak to another male. She would come to purpose, church late on purpose and leave early. So that when he asked her if she spoke to a male that day, she could say no. But when I'd preach about salvation, she looked like she's under conviction. I had somebody dig me up an address. I said, I got to go out and talk to these people. So I went out. And I had trouble finding the place. It was out, way out in the country. and Stopped, asked somebody for directions. They said, oh, you don't want to go back there. I went back, knocked on the door. A large, gruff, angry-looking man answered the door. Who are you? What are you doing here? Well, sir, I'm the pastor of the church over by the highway. And I uh, said, your, your wife's been attending our services. I've never actually met her or spoken to her. But, but she's been attending our services. It's my normal pattern when somebody visits our church. I go visit them. So I was hoping I could come by and talk to her, maybe talk to you as well about the Lord. Do you know who I am? I said, sir, to be honest, I've heard rumors. But that I'm standing here face to face with you, I'm really hoping they're not true. <laughs> he broke up laughing just like you did. He said, ah, come on in. Went in, sat down. I went through the gospel. I told them both Christ died for both of them. With his blessing, she put her faith and trust in what Christ did for her on the cross. And he told her 
she could go to that, our church, any time she wanted to for any reason with no limitations. So when it's the only place you're allowed to go, you become pretty faithful pretty quick. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, special services. He would come to church on occasion. We had police people in the church. Police would look at him sitting there. And he'd look at them, and I'd be up in a pulpit laughing at the whole thing. It was just... They had a little girl born. And I went to the hospital when the little girl was born and sat with him and his criminal friends while waiting for the birth. It, it was just unusual. They, they weren't comfortable with me like he was. And then they had another little girl born, and I went to the hospital and sat with him and his criminal buddies. Then one day I'm making a visit at a hospital, and a church secretary calls me. She says, Pastor, she says, I don't know how to say this, but some guys from the mafia are here looking for you. I said, okay. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. Tell them I'm here at the hospital. Tell them to come meet me here. I thought that's a nice public place to meet. And, uh, they come, and it, it, it's Fritz's buddies. And they said, Fritz has had a heart attack. He's in the hospital. They've told him they have to do open heart surgery or he's going to die. But he said, no one's allowed to touch him until you get there. And says, we have a guard at the door, and he told us to come get you. I said, okay, I'll meet you there. They said, no, he told us to get you. He said, don't worry about it. We'll take care of your car. It'll, it'll get home. He said, you're going with us. So I find myself in a car riding with all these <laughs> professional criminals. We go to the hospital he was in. Go up in cardiac care. And sure enough, they got a guy armed there who was not letting anybody in his room. And the hospital people are very uncomfortable with everything. So I walk in. All these people are there. He looks at me and he says, did you mean it? I said, what do you mean? He said, you told me that Christ died for me, even for me. I said, well, I meant it, but that's not the important part of the story. Here's the important part of the story. Christ meant it. Amen. And I went through the plan of salvation with him again. Medical people there, his criminal buddies there, a circus of people there. And I went through the gospel with him again, and he trusted Christ as his Savior. Amen. Because Christ meant it. Yes, sir. I didn't have to wonder about that. I didn't have any questions about that. I knew it didn't matter who I was talking to. A few weeks later, he came to church. So I baptized him. It, it was just sort of an unusual thing. He didn't know how to act at church. He didn't know how to talk. I mean, he, he didn't know how to talk without cursing. But he kept coming to church. And he made an interesting church member. And he did not like it when anybody disagreed with the pastor. I mean, he was really serious about that. And uh, it made it very, very clear. The pastor is the guy. He's in charge. He didn't like anybody disagreeing with the preacher. In fact, one time I had fuss with some folks, and he asked me if I wanted something done about them. And I, t I tell folks I lied. I told him no. And, uh, but... I didn't have to wonder about whether Jesus died for him or not. I never have to wonder with anybody about whether Jesus died for them or not. Okay. Boitner, and I've forgotten his first name, um, he is probably the most... Uh, Clear, he, he's pro-Calvinist, but if you wanted to understand what the Calvinists are saying about Calvinism, many of their books are hundreds, hundreds of pages. His is a couple hundred pages, very clear, very direct. He said, universal redemption means universal salvation. The extreme Calvinists argue that Christ must save everyone that he died for. They reason thus, if Christ died for everyone, then everyone will be saved. And, and that came up in our question and answer time yesterday. Let's think about the logic of this statement. That would be like saying if medicine is available, for every, then everyone must be healed. This is obviously false. Medicine, though available, will not do any good until it's taken. There's more than enough cool, refreshing water for every thirsty person in the village. Does this mean that every person in the village will have his thirst quenched? 
only if every person drinks. Again, it's human logic. We do not base our doctrine on human logic. We base our doctrine on plain, plain, clear statements of Scripture. We need to make difference between redemption accomplished and redemption applied. From Nicholas von Zinnendorf, founder of the Mennonites, a great missions movement. Lord, I believe we're sinners more than stands upon the ocean shore. Thou hast for all a ransom paid, for all a full atonement made. Continuing, discuss the doctrines of Calvinism to the doctrine of irresistible grace. A Calvinist explanation for the doctrine of irresistible grace. Again, we're letting them put it in their own words. Irresistible grace. The result of God's irresistible grace is a certain response by the elect to the inward call of the Holy Spirit when the outward call is given by the evangelist or minister of the word of God. Christ himself teaches that all whom Christ has elected will come to a knowledge of him. Men come to Christ in salvation when the Father calls them, and the very Spirit of God uh, leads God's beloved to repentance. What a comfort it is to know that the gospel of Christ will penetrate our hard, sinful hearts and wonderfully save us through the gracious inward call of the Holy Spirit. Now let's react to that. Salvation comes by grace through faith. Amen. Nothing said there about it being irresistible. God gave man dominion over the earth, Genesis 1.26. God, Satan tries to blind the mind of man, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. We're commanded to preach the gospel to all men just as if they could all believe. Would you go to Matthew chapter 28? The Great Commission. Yes, sir. Let's look at verse 19, 20. Should be 18 through 20, which is what the note should say. The one of dash is out of place. 18 through 20. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach. I wonder what the word all means. I wonder how many nations are included in that reference to all nations. Uh, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. It's a message for all nations. That's what God told us. It's not what a theologian told us. Okay. If God is sovereign, again, that's the argument over and over again. Common claim of Calvinists is that if God is sovereign, he must make the choice about who is saved and when. If God is sovereign, the Calvinists would say, if God is sovereign, he must make the choice. That's absolutely true. I am not saved because I chose God. I'm saved because he chose me. And the love of God is so real that he chooses everyone that comes to him. Yes, I'm saved because God chose me. I'm saved because he's sovereign. But he's told me who he chooses. So I'm going to believe him and not John Calvin or anybody else. It says repeatedly that he has given man a free will to exercise about salvation. Go with me to John chapter 3, verse 14 through 18. John three sixteen, most popular verse, well-known verse in the Bible. It's quoted all the time by Calvinists who don't believe it. Let's look at John chapter 3. And verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever, 
I wonder who that includes. Surely, whosoever must be you folks on this side. And certainly it's me. But I'm not so sure about the folks on this side. Because, you know, it's the word whosoever. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved... Yeah, I wonder who that includes. Well. That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him. See, whosoever. That's this side, right? Whosoever. Uh-huh. Okay. The important thing is that it's me. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, yes, so. but he that believeth not is condemned, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The issue is whether you believed or not. Yes, so. That's who God chooses. I, I look at my two grandsons. I love with all my heart. The thought of a God who might choose one of them to salvation and one of them to damnation without giving them any chance to respond at all, I could not bring myself to love and respect that God. I understand. They'll have a free will. He will not force salvation upon them. But the idea that he might condemn one and redeem the other arbitrarily, I would not be able to get past that. Which is again why King James said, if you want to turn somebody against God, get them to believe that. Now, let's look at... um, Oh, let's look at uh, Acts chapter 7 and verse 51. Acts 7:51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. Wait a minute. I thought we just learned from John Calvin that the Holy Ghost is irresistible. But these folks are being condemned because they did resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. They didn't have to resist him, but they could resist him. So why were they lost? Because grace is resistible, and they resisted it. We looked at, at, uh, uh, let's look at um, John chapter 1 and verse 12, while we're in this neighborhood. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. By the way, this will be another chapter. What what order did this happen in here? They had the power to become the sons of God when they believed on his name. They believed first and then became the sons of God. The doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. And again, we discussed this yesterday. Um, I believe in the perseverance of the Savior. Many people say, well, that Calvinists are just saying they believe in eternal security. Well, I certainly believe in eternal security. But that's, that's not what they mean by perseverance of the saint. They mean if you really got saved, you will live in spiritual victory. You will be godly. And again, they will not define for you what it means to be, live in spiritual victory. John MacArthur wrote two famous books on this subject. 
And uh, his, his point was that if you're really saved, you, you live for the Lord and you do right. And that Christians can never be carnal. But, but 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, Paul calls Christians in Corinth carnal. So John MacArthur has to explain that. So he actually says in the book that the Bible didn't mean that they were carnal as a description of their nature, just that they occasionally acted carnal, but not that they were carnal. Boy, that's helpful. What would happen if you tried to read that verse without having John MacArthur's book handy? What would you think he meant when he said, you're carnal? What would you assume that meant? Well, a Calvinist statement, again, we're letting them put it in their own words, about the perseverance of the saints. Perseverance of the saints. Persever- and again, I mentioned this yesterday. Some people call themselves a one-point Calvinist. They say, I only believe in that one point. I- I'm a zero-point Calvinist. This is not something John Calvin got right. It's not something MacArthur and Piper and them get right. I'm a zero-point Calvinist. Perseverance of the saints is a doctrine which states the saints, those whom God has saved, will remain in God's hand until they are glorified and brought to abide with him in heaven. Romans 8, 28 through 39 makes it clear when a person truly has been generated by God, he will remain in God's stead. The work of sanctification, which God has brought about his elect, will continue till it reaches its fulfillment in eternal life. Christ assures the elect that he will not lose them and they will be glorified at the last day. The Calvinist stands upon the word of God, trusting God's promise they will perfectly fulfill the will of the Father in saving all the elect. All that is true. But this is not the same as the doctrine of eternal security. This doctrine teaches not just that a person will remain in possession of the gift of eternal life, but a person will always live in victory over flesh and the world. Will always live in victory over flesh and the world. Seriously, do you know anybody that always lives in victory? Well. And if you're going to tell me you always live in victory, I might want to ask a few questions. Yeah. I said that to Calvinist preacher one time and told me he always lives in victory. I said, would you mind if I ask your wife a few questions? <laughs> Turned out he did mind that. <clears throat> The idea that we always live in victory is not biblical. Romans 7, Paul describes a struggle. Yes, the Calvinist, Paul's describing what it was like before he was unsaved. He was struggling with being righteous before he was unsaved. Now, it's present tense, number one. Number two, that's every Christian story, whether you will admit it or not. Yep. Yep. And that's why, as I've said Previously, somebody tells me this. Oh, really? Do you always live in victory? And, and most folks don't want to tell me they always live in victory. It's just that that's what you do if you're a Christian. Define living in victory. It means you're not controlled by sin. Does it mean you never sin? Well, no, it doesn't mean you never sin, but you're not controlled by sin. So how much sin can you have without being controlled by it? For example... Do true Christians attend church? I'm talking to them. Yeah, true Christians attend church. If you're really saved, you'll attend church. Say, how often? I mean, is that three times a week? Boy, we got a lot of unsaved people in our churches if you got to go to church three times a week to be saved. I said, what if you only go once a week? How about once a month? How about Christmas and Easter? How often, if, if attending church is the mark of true salvation, how often do you have to attend? I want an answer. I say, and that and I, I'll bring up subject having a temper. To be honest with you, I have a temper. By the grace of God, with my wife's help, I do not lose it nearly as often as I once did. I didn't say never. I used to lose it a lot more than I do now. But um, I, I'll say, uh, if you lose your temper, is it proof you were never saved? Oh, no, no. You know, Christians can make it. I say, okay. And they say, but you can't, 
be controlled by a bad temper. Okay, so how many times can you lose it and still be saved? Seriously, I need to know this. How many times a week can you still lose your temper and, and you lose your temper and still be saved? Because I really, really need to know. How many times can you be lazy and still be saved? Um, how many times can you sit in a service or class and your mind wanders? Because I would say that's sin if you're sitting listening to preaching and your mind wanders and you're thinking about the basketball game or something. And need it or that. I said, but, but how many times can you do that until it's proof you're not saved? How many times can the men be rough in what they say to their wives and still be saved? Uh -oh. Or how many times can the ladies be rebellious and unsubmissive and still be saved? I mean, I, I really, yeah, I didn't hear much either, but anyway, I, I, need, I need real serious definitions here. Okay. John MacArthur bases his doctrinal lordship salvation, the gospel according to Jesus, and the book, the gospel according to Paul, on the doctrine of the preservation of the saints. So he said the Christians in Corinth were not really carnal. But the Bible says they were carnal. Because MacArthur doesn't want to believe Christians can be carnal because it doesn't fit his theology, so he takes everything in the Bible and twists it to match his theology. We're supposed to take our theology and match everything that's in the Bible. Exactly the other way around. Okay. Biblicists believe in the perseverance of the Savior. I'm not saved eternally because I hang on to God and always do right. I am saved eternally because God hangs on to me. A great comfort, by the way. New Testament reasons for not believing in the preservation of the saints as defined by Calvin or MacArthur or Piper or Pink or any of those ones. Much of the New Testament was written to warn believers about spiritual failure. Much of the New Testament was written to warn believers about spiritual failure. If we can't fail, why is so much of the New Testament written to warn us about failing? The New Testament describes a continual struggle in the Christian life. Romans chapter 7, verse 15 through 25. Again, read John MacArthur. Uh, I'll read John Calvin. They'll say, well, that was Paul describing what it was like to be unsaved. It's not at all what he was describing. It was present tense. He was describing the work of God in the same time in his life as he wrestled with his flesh. <coughs> and again, I would say, at, at MacArthur, said very point, he said, Christians do not have that struggle. I guarantee you John MacArthur has that struggle. Not because he's anything different or worse than the rest of us, because everybody has it. Yes, sir. See, when you're, I, I'm an evangelist, I'm preaching in a different church or, or more than one every week. So I'm somewhere different every week. For the most part, these people don't know me. I look pretty good to them. I'm always talking about the Bible and salvation and, and I'm preaching and people get saved and, and teaching the Bible and I look really good to them. That's because they don't know me 365 days out of the year. Because if you pastor people, sooner or later, those people could figure out what your faults are. And it's a little scary, but it's real. You pastor somebody for a while, they'll figure out whether you have a temper problem or not, or whether you get impatient. They'll know. 
See, I can preach in your church for a week and you probably don't know. <laughs> Every Christian has a struggle. Yes, sir. Young couples get married. They look at each other. They, he's, he's perfect. She's perfect. They're just wonderful. They're the most spiritual person. They don't have any faults. They're just... They're, and then you get married. And then you find out that you married somebody that still has a sin nature. And they wrestle with it. And sometimes they lose. And now, when they wrestle with their sin nature and they lose, it affects your life too. Because bef before, you might not have noticed much when you weren't living together. But now you're married and you're living in the same house. And you'll figure out. Yeah. My wife is one of the sweetest, kindest, gentlest Christians you would ever know. 23 and a half hours of the day. When she first wakes up in the morning, she's a monster. <laughs> For 30 minutes. I did not know this before we got married. Seriously. I didn't know this. And uh, not long after we got married, I said to her father, I said, why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you tell me? He just looked at me and smiled. <clears throat> oh, I figured out the cure to this. I'm off in private having my devotions the first half hour she's awake. She can be anything she wants to. I love to myself. I, I'm exaggerating, but only a little bit when I say that. It turns out she has an old sin nature she has to wrestle with too. Who knew? I'm not sure if you'd asked me the day before we got married if I could have told you that she had a, how I knew she had an old sin nature other than the Bible said so. But we'd been married a week, and I knew. And she knew that I had one. Our first big argument was how you roll the toothpaste tube. And for some reason, that was really important to both of us, that I wanted to roll it one way and she wanted to roll it the other way. And we, we got in a real argument over that. And I can think, how in the world does this get to be important enough to argue with? So ever since then, I've had the solution. We always have two tubes of toothpaste. There's hers, there's mine. <laughs> we get along fine. But the fact we got in an argument over something that stupid proves we still wrestling with an old sin nature. Thirdly, the New Testament illustrations of salvation are Abraham and David, neither of whom always lived in victory. Abraham lies about being married, makes a fool out of himself, and then makes the same mistake all over again, does it all again. David, oh my. Did David fall away from being faithful to the Lord? And then God would use him to write, blessed is that man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. David was going to heaven anyway but not because he was perfect. Ready? A genuine understanding of salvation leads to humility, Amen. not pride. A genuine understanding of salvation does not have you telling anybody how you live in victory all the time. It produces pride. Ungodliness and pride come from the idea of the perseverance of the saints that we always live in victory. I've seen it over and over again. That a person that causes trouble in the church because they're always looking at somebody else and they don't think that person is good enough and godly enough like them. But those are never the people that have a testimony for being godly. And now, especially in the age of the internet, there are preachers on the internet advocating the perseverance of the saints that, you know, if you're really saved, you always live in victory, and they always live in victory. And the only way they can get away with it is because nobody knows anything about them. Right. Right. I know a couple of them 
who, if you came across them on the internet, they would tell you they always live in victory. And I know what they are like. It's because you don't know them that they can say that to you. And, and I said to one of them, try saying that. He likes to get in internet debates. I said, try, try debate with me sometime and try saying that to me sometime, that you always live in victory. Because you know what I know about you. Just try it. Let's have that debate. He's not going to. You can say it, but you can't live it. Justification by works can only justify you before men. James chapter 2, and they like to run there and say, see, uh, you know, you're justified. James says you're justified by works. James says you're justified before him by works. I'm not justified before God by works. I'm justified before men by works. Okay. Five minutes, we'll take another break. Okay, let's go ahead. I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't say that clearly. I meant we'll take a break in five minutes. But since you're all started, take your break. Go ahead, take your break for 10 minutes. All right. It's all right. Take your break. <laughs>